So Dr. Brenner, you, there are some you know, stories that follow you. One of them is your first meeting uh, with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and uh, he met you and he invited you to seek your advice on what he should do in the area of biotech. And can you tell us what you said to him at that time? And well, how your it, life in Singapore started? It wasn't really Lee Kuan Yew, it was his deputy, a okay. very great man called Go King Sui, okay. uh, who was uh, the deputy prime minister. And he invited me, but during my visit, he actually uh, brought me to see Lee Kuan Yew. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, their idea was to start biotech industry. But I said they, they just were not at a standard to do so. Okay. So I recommended that they set up, they needed to train PhDs. Mm -hmm. This is 1984. Mm -hmm. And I said the best way to do this is to set up a graduate institute, only take graduate students, mm -hmm. called that, that was the founding mm -hmm. of IMCB. Yeah. And uh, Mr. I always remember this because he always used to smile mm -hmm. and tell me this because Mr. Lee said he didn't think that Singapore this was the right thing to do for Singapore. He said to me, we are a nation of technicians. Oh. And I said, back to him, I said, if you don't do something like this, you'll remain a nation of technicians forever. <laughs> Great. And because of that, a lot of the research... Well, he then, uh, they then started it. It's... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, IMCB uh, continues, uh, it was agreed. I was very impressed with Mr. Lee. Yeah. Because I thought the man had not only the vision, but to think in those days of aiming to create a modern society mm -hmm. in this forsaken suburb of the British Empire, yeah. this hot, steamy place. I thought that's vision, but he also had the drive to get it done. Yes, yes. yes. There are many people with vision, but see, I, to see this in 50 years. There are many people of great vision, but poor eyesight. <laughs> 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 so, I want to go back a little bit to uh, the background of Dr. Brenner when he was not quite Dr. Brenner. So, going back to the 1942, when you were 15 years old, when you were um, doing your medical degree, etc., you know, you were talking a lot about the gap year, you know, the gap year that took and how that was a turning point in your life. You want to tell a little bit about that? Well, I started a university in Johannesburg, Witz, as it was called, when I was 15. Mm. And uh, it was then, it was a six-year course. But they then uh, discovered I would be too young to qualify as a doctor. I started doing medicine. I wasn't really interested in medicine, I was interested in science. Mm -hmm. But uh, the only science you could do there would fit you to be a teacher in a school. So mm -hmm. I became, I was lucky enough to get a bursary that paid my fees in Johannesburg mm -hmm. from my local town council. And so I decided to branch out to do a medical BSc mm -hmm. uh, in the third year. Mm -hmm. And uh, that proved to be uh, 
just the sort of life that I thought I'd like to lead. Yes. <laughs> when you were left alone and uh, just get on with doing things. <laughs> well, I don't know if you are quite left alone. So, you know, talking about that, you know, you have decades of experience in science and you've always resorted to kind of um, non-traditional ways of getting things done. So, and you told me the last time we met uh, what you thought of bureaucrats. So, but, you know, you've accomplished a lot also. I mean, not many of us can sit here and say we got the Nobel Prize. So, what were some of the things you had to do? Can you tell us one or two things you did where to just get things done? You may not have followed the order, but you just ask for forgiveness later. Well, I think this is good advice to everybody that's under the age of 20. <laughs> you, there's only one way to get things done, which is to do them. <laughs> I, I know this may sound funny, but I decided that when I was, I think I must have been three and a half or four years, that the only way is just go and do it. If you can't read, go and learn to read which is what I did. And if you can't do any of the other things. So my generation, lots of people there like me, we're all self-taught. We never waited. Mm -hmm. We never waited for to have teaching in a subject or to have people. Of course, there were lots of people, school teachers, uh, people telling you what to do. But sometimes you could always pretend to be deaf. So can you tell us a little bit about what you did in Paris where you were trying pretending to be deaf? Well, that's what I, I discovered that when I was working in Paris at the Pasteur Institute, I wanted to work at night in the lab, but you weren't allowed to do it. At, but you had to make, get special permission from the director, I know it sounds like Singapore, but, <laughs> and it took six weeks to make an appointment with the director, and I was only there for three weeks. <laughs> so I decided the only way to succeed is to pretend to be deaf. <laughs> and so I would go up to the concierge, the security person, and I would shake his hand and say, ça va bien, and he would rattle off in French, and I would say, pardon, pardon, and just walk in. <laughs> I can't stop you. <laughs> and uh, uh, you're uh, very well known for uh, all of in in inventing societies. So tell us a little bit about your Orion Society. Well, I decided that I had to have an excuse not to attend meetings because one of the things that has, that has happened now over the last 50, 60 years is a tremendous growth of bureaucracy. We have hundreds of people having meetings where they decide only two things. The, the question is, they only have, they had an agenda of three subjects on the agenda. The first subject is, uh, where will we hold the next meeting? <laughs> Second subject is, who will we invite? And the third subject is, where do we go for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> so I decided that I wouldn't go to these meetings. And the only valid excuse they would accept is that you had another meeting. <laughs> and so I invented a society. It was called the Orion Society. It had very distinguished members. It was very famous for about 10 years. And it had hundreds of subcommittees, working parties, groups that had to meet. And so I would always say, I'm sorry I can't come to your meeting uh, because I have to attend working party 
see of the Orion Society. <laughs> Soon everybody wanted to know what it was about, but I made it clear it was impossible to join and you couldn't get into it. But it, lots of people tried, but they couldn't. <laughs> so how do you translate that to, um, you know, avoid all this bureaucracy, but let the young talent uh, surface? And so what do you do with all your young students? I leave them alone, <laughs> but I help them. No, you see, I, I celebrated last year 70 years of science. That is, I published my first paper in 1945. So wow. last year, 70 years. So I think I've had... <laughs> So I think I've had quite a lot of experience, and I think one of the things of being old is that you know a lot, and if you're in, uh, that's bad. It's yeah. very bad to know too much, because the big thing about young people is that they're ignorant. Yeah. And that's a big advantage, because if you know too much like me, you never try to do anything because you say, well, it won't work. Yeah. But if you're young people, you don't know about it, you'll try. Yeah. And very often you will succeed. So uh, <coughs> I think that the best way that I can do with these people is it's called mentoring. I don't like that word, mm -hmm. but it's become now official. Everybody's now a mentor or a senior mentor. They now have grades, a deputy mentor, <laughs> a mentor's a private assistant mentor. <laughs> so, yes. So, uh, I think the best thing is what people do not understand about science, especially as it is being over-organized today, is that it's both a craft and an art. The best thing you can do in science was exactly what people did in the 17th century, 16th century. You get yourself apprenticed to a great journeyman. It was the way people learned painting. Mm -hmm. It was the way people learned to make furniture. So. All the crafts were learned from someone skilled in, skilled in the business. And of course, if you, have a, if you have a mentor like Michelangelo, you come out not a bad sculptor after this. Yes. And so I think science is very similar. Mm -hmm. If you can work with a good person and learn from the way they think about problems, mm -hmm. the way they look at things, and how they can do it, mm -hmm. that is the best way to teach the subject. You know, partly the thing about science is how you may need to evolve your thought along with the developments also. The thing that fascinates me is on one hand, you're known for the C. elegans and how the model, uh, how it models the organism and the body development. A lot of uh, things are done in terms of studying about the body through some other organisms. But now you're talking a lot about human biology and how we can learn from our own cells maybe, et cetera. So what's your change in thought in that? Well, my change in thought is very simply the product of the last half a century. Right. We've now amassed. You see, what, you do, what people don't understand is the reason why humans are different from chimpanzees. They're our closest cousins. But you see, the trouble with the chimpanzee is that it is, spends all of its time looking for food. All right? All of the time, looking for food, teaching the young to look for food, 
and all of the time just in maintenance. Yeah, all right. But you see, along comes this chimpanzee who climbed down from the trees mm -hmm. and stood upright. And he decided, well, he didn't decide, but why bother to wait? No, a million years till you grow hair to keep your body warm. What you go out is you go out, you kill another animal, and you put on its skin. Yeah, right. And then you don't, you are no longer being controlled by nature. Right. Nature, there's a new relationship with the advent of human beings. And that has continued for maybe six million years. Yeah. Until the big acceleration 10,000 years ago to the even bigger acceleration in the last 50 years. So we have technology, and technology is our answer to nature. And technology allows us to overcome all our defects, if you like, mm -hmm. that Evolution has moved, if you like, to a different platform. So it's all the same. It's always getting more and hopefully better. But of course, you realize in evolution, there are lots of animals that fell by the wayside, yeah. became extinct. Mm -hmm. And that could happen to humans as well. Mm -hmm. So certainly has happened to some of our society's mm -hmm. structures that have become extinct. Yeah. So I think we just need to have this full perspective. So what could be more interesting for future education than to understand this singular animal there's no one else like us on this planet mm -hmm. to understand how we got that way biologically and how we got that way through history and, how, and what we do and all of human products. So yes. I think there's only one science to learn and that's human science and that's the only science we should be we need to understand and progress with. If I had my way, I would have a course in the human sciences that every politician should, would have to pass, at least in the first division of the second class, in order to stand for election on anything. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So what do you, I mean, now that we have the bureaucracy, we have the government, we have all these systems, what would you like to see happen? Well, I better not say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from shooting everybody, what else would you no, like to well, see happen? Well, I think, you see, there is now a kind of culture which I find there are so many people whose only job is to tell other people what to do. Yeah. Or so in many cases, tell other people to tell other people what to do. Yeah. In fact, we've got this pyramid yeah. of people that decide. And the point is that, you know, as they say, where does the buck stop? Yeah. The buck stops where someone's got to do something. Yeah. You know, you can't just escape that, yeah. because if, the bucks, if people refuse to do things, the whole thing would collapse, because yeah. it's just built on this. Now, I'm interested to see how that evolves, mm -hmm. and you can see little things inside this. It is because, you see, the thing is, the thing about humans, which is unique, no other animal can visualize the future. We can. Yeah. 
we can. So we invent something called planning. That is where we try to do the history of the future. Yeah. We try to write it in advance. Yeah. All right? No other animal can do that. Animals have memory, but only about the past. past. Yeah. We're the only ones who can project into the future. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, we can have analysis of what is the future that we want. And that is what I think most people uh, haven't got down to thinking hard enough, what future would we like? What future are we going to have in Singapore here? Yeah. Let's say 200 years' time, what will Singapore be like? Yeah. I've often said, I just want to come back to Earth for one day in 2053. That is the 100th anniversary of DNA discovery. I'd just like to come back for one day just to see what has happened. Yeah. So yeah. maybe you can start thinking yourself, what would you like to see happen in 2053? Yeah. It's still a bit of time, yeah. but uh, just think about it and think whether the direction we're going points in the right way. So one of the questions is, if we are raising children today, you know, the science is developing so fast, the technology is developing so fast, whatever they study today is obsolete by the time they yeah. graduate. Sure. So what is the one or maybe two values or things you believe we should instill in our children so they become these learners for life? Well, all children are scientists when they're born. It just takes their parents and schools and universities to knock it out of them. But yeah. all children are explorers. All children try things. If you've had children and have watched them, yeah. then you know it is everybody stops them from what is a natural thing. Yeah. So that's what, that's what a scientist is. He's yeah. a child who never grew up or didn't listen to his parents or his school teacher or the bureaucrats that did it. Yeah. So I'm still playing, playing in the jungle. <laughs> so, um, and a lot of people don't know that you took part in the anti-apartheid movement. So what made you say, I'm going to take a stand? Or what did you actually do at that time? Well, it's an interesting period because the government changed in 1948 in South Africa and the Nationalist Party came into power, stayed in power for the rest of time. And my university didn't have a color bar. That is, it had Indians, you, most of the students were white, mm -hmm. but it had Indian students and it had a lot, it had African students for which the government provided six scholarships a year. So there were six medical scholarships. So when the new government came in, the first thing they tried to do was, by administrative reasons, prevent people from coming to it because they believed in pure white and so on. And uh, they made it necessary for Indians to come to Johannesburg. They had to cross a provincial border. So they stopped them coming. Most of them were doing law and uh, subjects like that, and medicine, yes. So they tried to stop them by not refusing them permission to leave Natal, which was, of course, where most, uh, most lived. Mm. The other thing they did, and this is an interesting story, is they stopped they deported people 
who came from Mozambique. Mozambique belonged to Portugal at the time. And there was an African there called Eduardo Mondlani, who came and was being deported. He was studying, teaching education in Johannesburg. And I remember that the first day that, uh, the first time that we held a big meeting, I was chairman of the Students' Council. And this was the first time the government had sent police onto the university premises. But we knew they were police. Uh, because they all used to ride motorcycles and wear hats. So all the front of the hat was always turned up. So if someone came to you, and as he came to me and said, I'm a member of the public, can I have a copy of the resolution? I said, what rank do you hold? And without thinking, he said, detective sergeant. (laughs) <laughs> so, of course he was a police. Yeah. I went to complain how um, I had a big row there. At this. But Eduardo Monlon was deported. Yeah. He later became the leader of the Mozambique Liberation Movement. Mm. And he was assassinated mm. uh, in Frankfurt many years later as the leader of the Mozambique movement. So those are some of the things that they did. We also, just final little story, which had a thing, with when the government then took away the scholarships, we decided we collect money Mm -hmm. and we found it scholarships of our own Mm. from the students. And we got support from the Swedish students. Mm. And they raised enough money in Sweden to support a scholarship at the university for Africans. I later discovered that the leader of the students at that time was Paula. He was the prime minister assassinated in the streets of Stockholm. Wow. Later on. So it's a funny kind of relationship. But that was the only uh, thing about the apartheid that uh, I think, and then of course, I always had, when I went to England, I made the choice. Either I had two choices. I could stay in South Africa and, you know, carry on, which some of my friends did, or I could just leave it and go, go into science. And I looked at my skin, and I said, I'm going into science. Yeah. I don't really belong there. You know? So that's what happened. Yeah. So my last question to you is, if you were not Sidney Brenner and somebody asked you, tell me a little bit about Sidney Brenner um, and what's the one thing about him that nobody knows, what would you tell him? Hmm. <laughs> Uh, well, I can tell you one thing that I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Nobody knows, you said. That includes me. Okay. No, I think, uh, I think it's interesting. You see, I've, I'm aiming to go on till another, till the 13th of January next year when I'm 90. I may change my mind and decide longer, but at least till then. Yeah. So, so when you've given yourself 
six months or seven months, you say, what do you want to do? Yeah. And what do you, how do you want people, what is your legacy? Yeah. You say, so I don't believe very much in uh, leaving these things. I, I said, I prefer to be a legend and not a myth. <laughs> you see, uh, because a legend is one thing and a myth is something else. Yeah. But I think I come from a tradition that says when you die, you die. You just turn into dust and you go. There is no heaven, there's even no hell, but you just die. So none of the religion has got anything to do with me. And in my tradition, all you do is, what have you left on earth? Mm -hmm. What have been your deeds? And I believe that it is the people you've helped mm -hmm. that might remember you. And those are the only things that count. And of course, your own children, that's your genetic legacy. But that may disappear very soon, may die out. Mm -hmm. So I think it is only what you have done that you be remembered by. And then only for a very short time. Because you see, most people believe the history of science has only got two epochs, the last two years and everything else before that. <laughs> so while I'm very pleased to be in the same group as Darwin, Einstein, Archimedes, Pythagoras, that is the perspective of most people. You have to understand that. The younger you are, the less further back you look. The yeah. rest, but the, the more further forward yeah. you should be looking. Yeah. So it's up to you. The future is up to you. Yeah. Science is a way of being a criminal without being arrested. <laughs> so in the next few months, what are one or two things you definitely want to do? Oh, I've got a lot of things I want to do. I want to finish what I'm, what I'm working on now, mm -hmm. and I want to continue doing on things I've started working on now, yeah. and I want to find new things to work on that I can start doing when i finished what I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>